to turn to Haggai in the Old Testament. It's just two chapters. You know how many books of the Bible have two chapters? Only one. <laughs> yeah, only this one. There's ones and there's threes. But, uh, at least that's what somebody told me, so if you find another one, I'll be wrong. Book of Haggai. Almost to the end of the Old Testament. Not many people name their, their sons Haggai anymore, I guess. I don't know. Maybe in Israel they do. Haggai's time is um, when Israel has returned from uh, the captivity, Babylon and, and so on. And um, they've, they've gotten organized and they've, they've put in the foundation of the temple. But then they quit. And uh, that's where Haggai comes in. Uh, the, you know, the Israel had stopped short, and uh, he gets them back on the, on the job. It, it, he's mentioned in Ezra, of course. He's a, a prophet that God used uh, during those times. He and, uh, let me think here, let's see. Um, Ezra, I'll just read a, a verse to you. Then the prophets Haggai the prophet and Zechariah, that's the other one the son of Edo, prophesied unto the Jews that were in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel, even unto them. Then rose up Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Jozadek, and began to build the house of God. So this, this is an encouraging story because he preaches and they do what God says. <laughs> so that's good. Uh, but the first, the first part here in, in chapter 1 is God's call to build. You know, like I said, they'd it started and then it got discouraged and quit and so on. If you read Ezra and Nehemiah, you'll see that it wasn't just that they quit. There was others opposing them and, and so on. Uh, but let's read the first six verses to start with. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now therefore thus said the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. Ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Yeah, you've probably felt like that before. <laughs> uh, here's the problem. He asks them a question there, or he makes a statement. Consider your ways. What he's saying to them there is, how's this working for you? <laughs> yeah, how's this working for you? You know, you, you, you started ignoring the Lord, and all of a sudden you, you're not warm enough, you don't have enough clothes, you don't have enough food, your money just seems to go in your pocket and fall out. You know, it doesn't, nothing seems to be working right. And uh, part of their problem was, you might say apathy. Um, you, you notice there in, in verse 2, that this people say, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. It's not the right time. <laughs> you know, there's some people, it's never the right time to work. <laughs> but that, that wasn't their, you know, they weren't just lazy people or something like that. Some, some people think they might have even linked it to prophecy and said, oh, you know, we, this prophet or that. You, know, you can prove anything by prophecy if you want to. Uh, and some people think that they, some had tied it to different prophecies. Uh, but anyway, they're just saying, oh, it's, it's not the right time. And part of it was their, their selfishness. In verse 4, you noticed he said, is it time for you to dwell in your nice houses? <laughs> that uh, sealed houses, uh, it's talking about, not, they, did, they didn't just have walls, they had nice paneled walls, sealed. Uh, they, they were looking after themselves, but they didn't bother to look after the, the, the temple, which was, for them, that was the center of their worship. You know, for us, a building is not that important. I mean, just Christian character tells us to look after it and do the right thing and so on, and we need it to meet and so on, and that. But in, in the Old Testament, man, they had to do these sacrifices, and it was very involved with the temple. Um, and God says to them, consider your ways. How's that working for you? Uh, 
there in verse 6, you know, all those things that are, are going on. Then in verse 7 and following, he gives them some instruction. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house. And I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. <laughs> He's just saying, it was gone, you know. Why, said the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon all the labor of the hands. <laughs> God said, because you've not been doing this, you've had all these, these problems, but he, his instruction is go and get what you need, get the wood and time to, time to build the temple. Well, verse 12, then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. Isn't that good to read? You know, it's so nice to see when people uh, hear what God says and, and do what he says. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, in the Lord's message unto the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, now, it always tells their, their fathers, doesn't it? Now, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. All they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. So that was a good, good response. You know, Haggai preaches. Now, that's the kind of response a preacher wants. <laughs> you know, he, he lays out the word of the Lord and says, yeah, we'll do it. And uh, what a blessing it is to see as, as they get excited again about seeing the temple finished. Well, chapter 2 pretty much starts with uh, a bit of discouragement. I'll read all the verses, but uh, verse 1, he says, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month. So what is this? It's about a, about a month later. They've been working on it. Came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and to the residue of the people, saying, Who is left among you that saw this house in her first glory? And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it as nothing? Now, already, some of them are getting a little bit discouraged. You can read in other places, Ezra and Nehemiah, there's folks who still remember the old temple. And uh, they're saying, oh, this is not a patch on the old temple. <laughs> this is not like the old days. We, boy, back in the old, good old days, you know, you should have, oh, let me tell you about the temple we had. <laughs> and here's these people just working as hard as they can. And then there's others, and we know that because we read it in other places as well. But, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of folks who, uh, they're always looking back to the, to the good old days. And, uh, you know, Sometimes you find out that the good old days weren't as, as good as you thought. But uh, in Ezra chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice. <laughs> oh, it's not what we thought it would be. Others were happy, and so you can tell the difference between the, the shouting and the crying. Um, there's a verse in Zechariah, just a little bit to your right there, Zechariah 4, verse 10. You probably heard this verse. Sometimes the world will even quote this, this idea. Who hath despised the day of small things? Don't despise small things. You know, sometimes a little thing can make a big difference. And, uh, you know, starting is important. And when you start something, it's not going to be great, usually. Occasionally something takes off and it's great right from the beginning, but most things start small. And, uh, you know, for them to obey the Lord, uh, it wasn't going to be glorious all of a sudden. Uh, we need to be careful we don't despise small things. God might give you a, a little ministry. Well, listen, he, he said, if you'll be faithful in that which is little, he'll trust you with, mo with much. Uh, the key is do something. <laughs> Better to do something small than nothing. Uh, we had a teacher at Bible college who'd been a missionary 
And uh, some people would say, you know, that he, uh, he was a has-been, you know, because he wasn't a missionary anymore. His, his saying was, well, I'd rather be a has-been than I never was. <laughs> and he was doing a great thing. We really appreciated him. But, uh, you know, discouragement can come, but be careful. And then he, he gives them some encouragement there in verse 4. Uh, verse 4, Yet now be strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord, and be strong, O Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all ye people of the land, saith the Lord, and work, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And God encourages them, just be strong. Just do what you can do. And uh, you know, he, he says it to all the different ones, and, and he says, be strong and work. You know, that's, uh, that's what God calls us to do. That's why we say that work for the night is coming. That's, that's kind of a hard song to sing. Uh, it wasn't, I didn't find it real encouraging, but anyway, uh, it, it's true. We need to do what the Lord calls us to do. And then he says, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. Here's two really encouraging things that God says to them and says to us as well. Uh, we can be strong because of the strength of the Lord. Who knows a verse about uh, receiving strength from the Lord? Do you have a, a verse you encourage yourself with? I can do all. There's a good one. That might make a good memory verse for Holiday Kids Club. Uh, another one? Be strong and have a good courage. Yeah. Those are th the kind of things that encourage us, isn't it? When God says be strong because we know he's not saying in our strength. He, he's saying trust him. Do, do what he calls us to do and work. And then we know that because then he says, for I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts. And uh, we see quite a few things here. Let me read on verse 5. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remaineth among you. Fear not. He says, I'm with you. Now, does he say more according to the word? No, just like when they left Egypt. You know, all those amazing things that happened when they left Egypt. God's power, you know, splitting the Red Sea and all those things that happen. He says, it's the same, I'm the same God. Same is true today. You know, the God that took them out of Egypt, the God that helped them to re, rebuild Jerusalem, the God that's put the Jews back in Israel today, <laughs> uh, that same God. He says, I'm with you. And we see his power, verse 6. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. Uh, we see his power. You know, God is able to shake the very world we, we stand on. We see his presence. And I will fill this house with, house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, you know, like he says, I'll be with you. Uh, we see his, his presence. We see his power. Verse 8, we see his possessions. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, we used that verse uh, Sunday night when we talked about a conviction about money. It belongs to the Lord. And one of the things that, that can help us with is God's work done in God's way, how does that saying go? Will not lack God's provision. Something like that. Uh, some famous missionary said that. And it's true. Um, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. God will provide. You know, we sing the, the chorus, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth in every mine. That's what he's talking about there. Uh, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord and the, the Lord's and the fullness thereof, uh, his possessions. And then verse 9, his peace. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. You know, as I, as I looked at those this morning, it made me think about the things that encourage us. And it's these very things. And the Lord's with us. We know his power. We know his presence. Uh, we know that he's able to provide. Uh, we can know his peace. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be dismayed. Uh, so God calls to build, and God calls to behold. He's saying, keep your eye on me. Look at me. That's where your strength is. Well, then God calls them to behave. <laughs> Let me read, this is an interesting verse, verse 10 through 14. In, in the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, ninth month, in the second year of Darius, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, 
and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. And said, Haggai, if one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and that which they offer there is unclean. And he's saying, he's talking about how they, they've been behaving backward. You, you know, you don't take something holy and touch something dirty and make it clean. When you touch something holy with something dirty, it makes it dirty. And yet, how often do people say, well, my good is going to outweigh my bad. And, you know, I'll just, I'm just doing the best I can. <laughs> God says that's backward thinking. And that's the way Israel had been operating. They were saying, oh, we're doing some great, you know, we're, we're making offerings and, you know, we're doing this and we're doing that. And God says, well, that's, uh, what was the word he is, that which they offer there is unclean. They weren't doing it in, in the spirit of holiness and the way God had, had told them to. You know, if, um, if you went to the doctor with a badly broken arm, he wouldn't come up to you and, and grab your other arm and say, boy, that's a good arm. Wow, look at that. That's, that is really good. Oh, and that head, that's a good head. Man, I like that knee. That's really working well. <laughs> he would go straight to your broken arm, wouldn't he? You wouldn't put it out like that. <laughs> and he'd go right to the problem. And that's what God does with our sin. We have lots of good things about us, you know, good things we're doing. God says, what about that? He goes right to that. And that's what we need to do. We need to agree with God. That's what God is saying to Israel. It's no good thinking that your, your good deeds will make the bad deeds okay. He's saying you've got to think, think straight. And then he goes on. As, he mentions this several times, you, you'll notice. Uh, that's why the blessing has been withheld. Verse 15. Now I pray you, consider from this day and upward, from before a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, since those days were when one came to an heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the press fat for to draw out 50 vessels out of the press, there were but 20. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail and all the labors of your hands, yet you turn not to me, saith the Lord. You got to say, if you want his blessing, you've got to turn to him. You got to deal with the sin. You've got to do it God's way. But then he goes on verse 18, blessing is coming. Consider now from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it, is the seed yet in the barn? Yea, as yet the vine and the fig tree and the pomegranate and the olive tree hath not brought forth, from this day will I bless you. The blessing is coming. You know, repentance, uh, they, were, they were doing what God was asking them to. Uh, when uh, Haggai preached, uh, the Bible says they obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. They began to, began to work. But we need to understand repentance and zeal don't bring immediate response. Uh, you know, we, we develop a maturing trust. Our trust is really in the promises of God. You know, there's, there's a lot of folks today, kind of a semi-spiritual thing where it's all these signs and wonders. It's a childish approach to faith. And, you know, sometimes God uh, does deal with us as, as children, but God wants us to develop a maturing faith, not in some sign or wonder, but in, in the promises of God, just trusting God. You know, they were building that temple, and man, it's just a bunch of, I don't know, I guess a few rocks in a, in a rectangle. It wouldn't have looked like much. That's why some of them were crying. <laughs> oh, that's the temple. Uh, but they were trusting that God would bless, and God had said he was going to bless that temple more than the first one. Our trust is in the promises of God. In those last few ver verses, uh, God's call is to believe. Verses 20 through 22, he's going to magnify his power. Uh, verse 20, and again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai on the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I will shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms, and I will destroy the strength of the kingdoms of the heathen, and I will overthrow the chariots and those that ride on them, and the horses and their riders shall come down, every one, by the sword of his brother. And God will magnify his power, is what he's saying here. Uh, God will be glorified. Uh, his purpose will be accomplished. And then in verse 23, he, he makes an, another promise. He says, In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, will I take thee, O Zerubbabel, 
my servant, the son of Shealtiel, saith the Lord. And I will make thee as a signet, for I've chosen thee, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, God will magnify his prince, you might say. And the immediate application, of course, is, is Zerubbabel. But I think you can look beyond this and see long term, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, after Zerubbabel, Israel declined. But God sent his signet into the world. Now, the world didn't acknowledge Jesus, but he'll return and he'll impose his authority on the world. In chapter 2, verse 7, I will shake all nations and the desire of all nations shall come. And that's talking about Jesus. It's, it's a great little book, the book of Haggai. It's uh, 38 verses, not very long. But there's some real key thoughts here, I, I think. One is priorities. You, you see these people had the wrong priorities. They were real happy to work on their own homes, but they weren't happy to do the work of the Lord. And we need to be careful. Uh, we need to put first things first. Um, Matthew 6, 33. Uh, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. But we need to be careful that we're not putting self and things before the Lord. Uh, secondly, you, you see a, a lot here about attitudes. You know, first you see them, they say, oh, the time is coming. You know, it's not, it's not time yet. Well, then in chapter 2, verse 3, they're basically saying, oh, the time's passed. <laughs> you know, this is, this is not as good as, it, as the first one was. Well, the Bible tells us the time is now. You know, we, we don't need to base our life on, on the past. Uh, we don't have to you know, try and duplicate things in the past or be like the past. We need to be like Jesus, and we need to do it now. And now is the time to live for him. Uh, there's a, a verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, where he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast. Steadfast means you're always in the now. You know, you're, you're just doing what you should do when you should do it. Unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's a real key thought, I think. Our, our attitudes are, are so important. You know, God can use me. We need to understand that. It's not our talents or our abilities, it's our God. And that's the key. Uh, attitudes, priorities. And then, as well, we need to understand what success really is. You know, as they looked at that temple, some of them thought, oh, this is no good. This is a failure. Uh, success is partly how you, how you define it. And it's not the size. <laughs> you know, you can have a, a work for God and be a success for the Lord working with one person. You know, doing the work of the Lord. It doesn't have to be a thousand people or a million people or, you know, whatever. Uh, we need to be careful that we do the Lord's work in whatever he calls us to do. Uh, I was thinking about this today, and it took me a while to find this verse because I couldn't think of the right word that was in it, but uh, it, it's Psalm 84, verse 10. And he says, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. You know, just doing what the Lord wants us to do. Whatever that is, that's success. Success is trusting and, and obeying the Lord, doing our part, doing what the Lord calls us to. Uh, so let me encourage you tonight. Now, here's some folks that had, it started off right, and then they got discouraged. And uh, Haggai came and preached, and, and God blessed, and, and uh, it was a, a, a victory in the work of the Lord in those days. Any comments or questions before we take some prayer requests tonight?